Good morning, everyone. You are watching News 3 now on this Monday, October 25th. Ooh, another Monday. Gosh, I wish that we had a four-day work week. I heard that somewhere someone was starting a petition to make it a four-day work week with a three-day weekend. I don't know where the petition ended up, but I would like to sign it because those weekends go way too quickly for me. I don't know about you, but I wake up Monday morning and I'm like, really again but you got to have a good attitude to get through the week we might have noticed this morning when you woke up it's pretty muggy outside i woke up and was like okay no sunshine total cloud cover walked outside and my hair immediately was like why did you curl me it is gross and moist out not a great morning but let's take a look at what the weather is going to be like for the rest of the week okay so there is good news because some fall weather is on the way, but I do have to talk to you about what's happening today. So take a look at this. Today, it is possible that we will reach a new record high. Today, if that cloud cover breaks and the sun is shining like it usually does, it is expected to be the warmest October 25th in nearly 30 years. Now, this October, we're in the 25th day, we have already experienced six days above 90 degrees here in the Brazos Valley. Like I said, today could bring the seventh day, which could be hot enough to be remembered for years to come. So today it could reach up to 92 degrees. Now it's pretty muggy out there right now, or at least it was when I got into work earlier this morning. Don't know if the clouds have broken quite yet, but we are expecting that if they do, we could reach that high of 92 degrees and it could be the warmest October 25th we've seen in 30 years. So with that, you see I'm in a tank top dress today. I highly recommend bringing water and sunscreen with you. Pretend like it's the middle of summer because it could be the hottest October 25th that we've seen could get up to 92 degrees today. But good news, this weekend is looking a lot cooler with the temperatures in the early morning and evenings down in the 50s. I'm super excited for that. I like when the days are in the 70s and the nights and early mornings are in the 50s. That works perfectly for me. Not a fan of cold weather, not a fan of hot weather. I like it nice and in between. I'm kind of like uh, Goldilocks and the Three Bears, right? The hair, you see it? Goldilocks, that's kind of who I am. I'm like, oh, I don't like it too hot and I don't like it too cold. I like it just right. I'm sure a lot of you are on board with that as well. So with that, you know, there, take that in mind as you go out on your adventures today. Maybe when you take your lunch break later this afternoon, just be prepared that if you're wearing a turtleneck sweater and jeans today, you are going to be dripping sweat. It could get up to 92 degrees today. All right, let's take a quick look at some of our headlines that we're going over today. Nationwide, more than 130 law enforcement officers have been killed in the line of duty this year. And today, a final farewell will be given to a fallen lawman with local ties. Kareem Atkins was working as a Harris County deputy constable when he was ambushed, shot, and killed. That happened last weekend. Today, there's a memorial service for him down in Houston. He'll be then laid to rest in Tomball. Atkins worked briefly for the College Station Police Department several years ago. He leaves behind a wife and two children. Atkins was killed while working at a North Harris County nightclub. Two other deputy constables were shot, but they did survive. The gunman still hasn't been arrested. There is now a $75,000 reward for his capture. Florida's governor wants to recruit more law enforcement, and he's using cash as an incentive, an incentive to do so. Governor Ron DeSantis plans to sign legislation during an upcoming special session that will award $5,000 bonuses to any law enforcement official who relocates to Florida. DeSantis says the move is in an effort to address the needs of police and sheriff's departments across the state. DeSantis is also working to stop federal vaccine mandates for people living in Florida. He's planning to call the state legislator back to fight the federal occupational safety and health administration's proposed new vaccine rule for large employers, an emergency standard announced by President Joe Biden just last month. 
Now let's bring it home and talk about Texas once again. A Texas homeowner is facing a first degree murder charge for killing a man outside of his home. Terry Duane turned himself in to the Caldwell County Sheriff's Office on Friday and was out on bond less than two hours later. He's accused of felony murder and the death of 31 year old Adele Dugui. Now a Moroccan, he's a Moroccan national who parked in Duane's driveway. Turner told police he thought he was armed, but the victim's girlfriend said she believes that he was just lost and had just pulled over to look up directions. An investigation is ongoing after a drag race killed two children. The crash happened at the airport race wars two this weekend. That's a drag racing event held at Perville. Now, an, a vehicle taking part in this drag racing event lost control and then struck a bunch of spectators. The victims were just six and eight years old. Eight other people were also injured. An Arizona gas station cashier is grateful for the help of a veteran who stopped an armed robber with his bare hands. Now take a look at this video. You can see this armed man walk into the store and point the gun at the register, right? You see it right there. Then in an act of bravery, the customer pushes the gun away and takes a swing at the suspect. Now, according to the sheriff, it was a juvenile suspected of armed robbery and aggravated assault. The veteran said he was able to take control because, quote, the Marine Corps taught me not to mess around. Now, we're still waiting to learn how Brian Laundrie died, but there's another big question. What's in the notebook found near his remains? Authorities also discovered a backpack and clothing. Still no word if those items will provide any answers about what happened to him or to his fiance, Gabby Petito. That will need to be processed. We want to make sure that that's handled as carefully as possible. You only get one shot at these types of items to hurry up and, you know, rifle through that potentially damaging uh, it would, you know, would not be helpful. Brian Laundrie's skeletal remains are now in the hands of a forensic anthropologist who's working to determine on a cause of death. A major detail that stands out in the timeline Laundrie's parents told police Brian appeared to be grieving six days before it was known publicly that Gabby Petito was dead. These new details are raising more questions about what the family knew the night Brian Laundrie disappeared. Now, of course, an update from the deadly shooting on a movie set in New Mexico. Well, it's revealed safety issues involving a member of the crew. Now, of course, actor Alec Baldwin, as we know, fired a prop gun on Thursday, killing cinematographer Helena Hutchins and wounding the director. Omar Villafranca is in Santa Fe, New Mexico, with more information. At a vigil in Los Angeles Sunday, film and television workers gathered to honor Helena Hutchins. Hutchins' death is now under investigation by the Santa Fe County Sheriff. According to an affidavit, Assistant Director Dave Halls grabbed one of three prop guns set aside by the film's armorer, Hannah Gutierrez, who took her first lead armorer job earlier this year. When Halls handed the gun to actor Alec Baldwin, Halls allegedly shouted, cold gun, indicating there was no live round in the chamber. Baldwin later fired the gun, killing Helena Hutchins and wounding the director, Joel Souza, who was standing behind her. And in a new affidavit released last night, Souza told investigators, Baldwin was rehearsing a scene that involved drawing his weapon and pointing it towards the camera lens. A 911 call from Thursday raises questions about how the gun was handled on set, including by Assistant Director Halls. It's a f***ing ID. He's supposed to check the gun. He's responsible. Maggie Gall was a pyrotechnician on a shoot with Halls back in 2019. She says Halls' behavior on that set compelled her to file a complaint with her executive producers. The first AD, they're not just steering the ship. They're also there to maintain a safe working environment. It was, Are there any safety concerns that you had when yes, you were there? No fire lanes, uh, hard to access. Um, doors were blocked. There were no safety meetings. While the investigation into the shooting continues, it's not clear if criminal charges will be filed, says New Mexico defense attorney Erlinda Johnson. Or they have to demonstrate criminal negligence, that the person acted recklessly with wanton disregard for the safety of others. 
We have repeatedly reached out to Halls and Gutierrez, but have not heard back. And we're expecting to learn more about this case at a Wednesday press conference. Omar Villafranca, CBS News, Santa Fe, New Mexico. We'll take a quick break now, but when we get back, we'll take a look at new updates in the fight against the COVID-19 pandemic, including the fact that millions of children in the United States could be eligible for the Pfizer vaccine really soon. We'll be right back. All right, folks. Well, let's take a look now at some of these updates in the fight against the COVID-19 pandemic in the country. Now, millions of children in the United States could be eligible for Pfizer's COVID-19 vaccine as soon as next week. An FDA panel meets tomorrow to consider recommending emergency use authorization for children ages 5 to 11, followed by a CDC vote next week. CBS's Bradley Blackburn has more information from New York. Children ages 5 to 11 could start getting vaccinated against COVID-19 as soon as early November. An FDA advisory committee is meeting Tuesday to consider recommending emergency use authorization of the low-dose Pfizer vaccine. The data looked good as to the efficacy and the safety. A review by the agency found Pfizer's pediatric vaccine is nearly 91% effective at preventing symptomatic COVID, with the benefits outweighing the risks of the most serious side effects. That includes myocarditis, a rare heart condition that's been linked to the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines in young men. The inflammation usually subsides on its own in a matter of days. 
The Biden administration has purchased enough vaccine for the country's 28 million children in that age bracket. Vaccinating children will be really important for us to be able to return to normal life as we know it. If the FDA formally signs off on the two-dose vaccine, kids ages 5 to 11 will be able to get shots at pediatrician's offices and even schools. Mom Kaylee Becker wants her nine-year-old son vaccinated. We're looking forward to the day that he is so, so we can have a matching set of protected kids. It could also be a game changer for holiday gatherings. Families that, that seek um, their first shot um, you know, by mid-November, um, that those children will be considered fully vaccinated by um, uh, the winter holidays at the end of December. Moderna says its half-dose vaccine showed a strong immune response in children ages 6 to 11. The company plans to submit data to regulators soon. Bradley Blackburn, CBS News, New York. The National Institutes of Health is investing $70 million from the American Rescue Plan to help bring more high-quality at-home COVID tests to the market. Now, the FDA has also authorized another over-the-counter rapid test antigen test. So we just heard about Pfizer's vaccine for kids, but how about Moderna? Well, Moderna is also right now testing the trial results of its COVID-19 vaccine for school-aged children. The pharmaceutical company says its trial showed smaller doses generated a, quote, strong immune response in children's age 6 to 11. More than 4,700 children participated in the trial. They were given two 50 microgram doses of Moderna's vaccine 28 days apart, smaller than 100 microgram dose given to adults. Moderna says the kids' antibody response kicked in one month after the second dose. The most common side effects included fatigue, headache, and sometimes fever. Moderna's trial has not been peer reviewed or published yet. The company does plan to submit their final results to the FDA. And we touched on this briefly before, but we'll go back to it. We're going to talk about at-home testing. So the Biden administration is working to make sure that you don't have to wait in line to test for COVID-19 this winter season. The National Institutes of Health, like I said before, is going to invest $70 million dollars to bring more over-the-counter tests to the market. Now, that money, of course, comes from the COVID relief package that was passed earlier this year. The NIH is also working to establish an accelerated pathway for the FDA to evaluate and approve tests for large-scale manufacturing. Health and Human Services Secretary Xavier Becerra says the easy-to-use tests are key to bringing peace of mind to families as the winter approaches. Now get this, it's cheap, easy to make, and in demand overseas, but a Texas-born COVID vaccine still hasn't made it into the United States market just yet. Developers hope Corbivax will be endorsed by the World Health Organization this year for global use, but the U.S. has yet to get on board. Operation Warp Speed spent none of its billions at the Houston lab. Experts say that's because the attention is on the vaccines made earliest, Pfizer, Moderna, and J&J, which all used the newest technology. Let's pop on over to our COVID-19 dashboard and take a look at how things are looking for the Brazos County today, shall we? So I'm going to pull that up for you right here. Looks like our active cases, our new cases, and our hospitalizations continue trending downward. Active cases reaching almost below 300 today. Four new cases being confirmed by the Brazos County Health District. Looks like they're also reporting zero new deaths today. Hospitalizations continue to decline as well. Now, just 4% of our hospitalizations in the Brazos County are made up by COVID-19 patients. Now, remember back to when the Delta variant hit the community hard. Back on October 1st, we were seeing active cases climbing to nearly 3,000 in one day. Now, the rest of this month of October, we've seen this steady decline. So from 3,000 active cases on October 1st, now it's October 25th, and we're reaching 314 today. Now, of course, we know we're not out of the clear just yet, but things are looking a lot better here 
in Brazos County, which is great news because it's just in time for so many fun Halloween events happening this weekend in the community. Haunted houses, Halloween town, bar crawls, parties, you name it. There's a ton of fun stuff to do and the cases are looking better. Now, with the holiday season approaching as well, a lot of people planning out their travels. Health experts are urging people to be fully vaccinated before they travel to see those loved ones, to gather with immunocompromised family members, family members who aren't, are young and aren't eligible to get the vaccine, older family members that maybe haven't gotten their booster shots yet. They also recommend, of course, if you're gonna be in an inside large gathering, to think about wearing a mask, but the thing that they're really focusing on, health ex experts that is, is being vaccinated before going to see your family for the holidays. Now, I'm sure all of you are very excited, as am I, to see my family after a year see without seeing them, but health experts are saying we're not out of the clear just yet. This morning, I read our research from the Texas Tribune saying that 9 million eligible Texans are still not vaccinated, haven't gotten their first shot yet. So like I said, cases here in Brazos County, pull that up for you one more time, are steadily declining, looking better. Just four new cases being uh, recorded today by the health district, but doctors, health experts warning us that we can't lose steam now. We have to stay diligent and remember to be vaccinated to wear masks when it's necessary, to social distance when it's necessary. Do our part to keep everyone in the community safe and healthy this holiday season. Like I said, so many fun events coming up from Halloween Town to par pub and bar crawls to uh, Wicked Woods Haunted Trails or Fright Nights Haunted House. There's so much happening, trunk or treat, trick or treat. It's all going on this weekend. As a community, we want to work to keep each other safe and healthy so we have an awesome Halloween and can move on to some more holidays with Thanksgiving and Kwanzaa, Christmas, Hanukkah coming up in December, then the new year. Hopefully this number will be down to zero by January 1st of next year. Well, a girl can dream, right? That's what we're looking at right now here in Brazos County. Happy to report active cases, new cases, and hospitalizations are continuing that downward trend in Brazos County. Y'all, we're going to take a quick break, but when we get back, we're going to be talking to the Brazos Valley Council of Governments. Now, they have a ton of resources, uh, just a plethora of resources available to everyone in the Brazos Valley and a lot of those resources are going unused, maybe because people don't know about them. So I got to sit down with a couple of people this morning who have a lot to share about the resources that are available to people in our community. Now, of course, we know that the BVCOG, their main goal for everything is to help people, to help people be able to afford things, to help people get educated, just to help people in our community. So in just a couple of minutes coming up after the break, I'll show you my conversations with a couple of people over the Brazos Valley Council of Governments. Stay tuned.
All right, well, I told you once, I'll tell you again, because it's important. The Brazos Valley Council of Governments has a plethora of resources available. Their main goal is to help people. Now, one way they're doing that is with this upcoming hiring event. It's called Red, White and You. Now, it's mostly aimed at helping our veterans, but it is open to everyone in the community. This morning, I got a chance to sit down with Executive Director Michael Parks to talk more about it. Mr. Parks, for any of our viewers who don't know what the Council of Governments does, can you just give us a quick refresher? Sure. We are a voluntary association of local governments, mostly counties. Every county that touches Brazos is a part of us, plus the cities. And uh, we are a mall of government services, if you will. We have everything from homeland security to housing, from transportation to HIV services to uh, utility assistance and even Head Start and, and programs for women, infant, and children. So. We, we do it all here. <laughs> and so one of the big things that you guys do is hiring, right, employment. And so talk to me a little bit about some of the awards that some of our businesses have won recently. Yeah, so uh, recently our, our workforce board, uh, which is, again, our governing body over this area for, for jobs, awarded Oldwin Goodwin Group as a large employer a award for best practices for working with our programs and, and getting folks into employment. Also, Blue Baker was uh, chosen as an award winner this year for small business and uh, uh, working with us, apprenticeship programs and hiring from our, our virtual job fairs and things like that. A very good corporate partner with the Workforce Solutions Brazos Valley. And then, finally, we want to talk about this hiring event that you'll have coming up on November 4th. It's an important one, so if you could give us some details, a rundown of what that looks sure. like. Sure, yeah, this is a great one because for years we participated in a red, white, and you hiring event. It's a statewide event held by every workforce board across the state on the same day, November 4th. We recognize our veterans uh, who play such a crucial role uh, in our country and then when they come home in our, in our workforce, and so this is an opportunity for any veteran, as well as anybody, I want to make sure everybody else understands that, are welcome to come to the Brazos Center between 10 and 2, November 4th, which is next week, by the way, uh, to look for a job. We'll have employers there. You can also participate online with that as well. So if you, if you can't make it to the Brazos Center, look for us online for a red, white, new hiring event. Okay, so more detail-wise, logistics, it, who can come to the event? I know you said anybody, so is it just anyone looking for an event? How can employers go if they want to hire people? So employers should contact us here at Workforce Solutions Brazos Valley, 979-595-2800, and then they can be signed up to, uh, to have a table or a booth there. But really, and if, even if you have a job but you want to upgrade skills, you want to, to, to branch out, this is an event for you. We can train you. We have money actually to pay for training if you're willing to go into one of our targeted opportunities. So uh, really, I would encourage anybody who has questions about their job or about a better job, they should come see us. And we talked really briefly before this interview started just a little bit about our un unemployment numbers. Talk to me a little bit about what that looks like right now in the Brazos Valley. We, we're doing really well. From, from a perspective of post-pandemic, uh, we're doing really well. We're not at our all-time historic lows, which Bryan College Station is very fortunate. We have led the state often in unemployment and low unemployment. Let me make sure I, <laughs> I clarify that. <laughs> low unemployment. And so we are, we're doing well. Uh, folks are going back to work. They're finding better jobs. The market is improving. Access to capital um, is there from a financial industries. And so things are coming back. Not as quick as we'd like to see them. There are still lots of jobs to be had. But right now, we're, we like the way the trends are going. So how important is a hiring event like this Red, White, and You event coming up? Well, sometimes you have, to, you have to encourage people. Look, there is still hope. There is still an opportunity. You still have a chance to do something better. Why not try? You know, why not try to have that job? Rather than having two, three, four jobs, why not find that one job that pays enough to cover all your needs rather than having to work, you know, all hours of the day and have multiple jobs? So we encourage folks to look about careers, not just jobs, but what do you want to be? Not necessarily when you grow up, you may already be grown up, but what do you want to be for the rest of your life? There's opportunities there, and we have skilled, trained staff to help you. In fact, our staff just won an award, uh, third in the state for proficiency in our staff. So we have a very professional staff here, and they're ready and eager to help folks find better employment. 
And one more time for viewers who might just be tuning in, Council of Governments, how do we get in contact with you if we have questions about that event? Sure. Our, I'll give you a couple of websites and I'll give you a phone number. Certainly, phone number works for everything. 979-595-2800 or bbcog.org. Brazos Valley Council of Governments, bbcog.org will get you to our to our website and, and all of our information there. Perfect. And I plan on putting this up on our website as well, so we'll have a link to all of your links, make it easier for everyone so they can just go on our website find out more about the event. Absolutely. Love to help people. We're all about doing good works, and it's doing good works for the people in the Brazos Valley, so we're happy to help. Now, one BVCOG resource we really want to highlight today is their utility assistance program. Today, we're seeing record high heat indexes, and then the cooler months are quickly approaching. Utilities, as we all know, are expensive. And while a lot of people in the Brazos Valley need help paying for them, so this morning I talked with program coordinator Brian Jones to learn more about the utility assistance program. So Mr. Jones, we're here to talk a little bit about this utility assistance program. First and foremost, I mean, what is it? What does it look like? Well, the, the utility assistance program is for residents of our 10 county service area and you can apply for utility assistance and get your current and arrears paid and then we score your application forward and we can pay months in advance uh, going forward. And so we have quite a bit of money right now. Who is able to get in contact with you and apply for this program? Any, any residents in our, in our current service area, which is 10 counties, like we said, um, you have to be income eligible. And we would just ask everybody to go on to the website or, or inquire with us to find out if they're income eligible. So what is the need to have a program like this in our community? This program really focuses on the lowest of low income families and people in our service area or if they're going through a hard time, if they lose income and they need it's kind of a gap in service to help with the utilities, we'll have that. Uh, and it's, it's, very, it's very good because it, you can kind of use our money to know that you can budget out your money if you're short on money. That totally makes sense. And so when we're talking kind of about this influx, you have a lot of money to give away to these people who are in need of it. What has been kind of the biggest struggle of finding people to apply for the program? Well, currently, right now, with the different stimulus package coming in from, from, from due to COVID and stuff this year, there's a lot of different monies out there, and, it, and it's kind of saturating the market in one way about information, and people just need to kind of slow down and focus on what's out there and know where it can best benefit them. And, and you know, a lot of the, the, the problems with spending money is we have such a large volume of it, and we have the same clientele base, but we're also trying to reach out and get those people that normally do not apply. And so we're going to try to do different uh, outreach techniques to try to reach people that, so they'll learn and understand that there is help for them if they need it. And any, even if you don't need it right now, you may need it in the future. And with the holidays and the, and the seasons coming on, uh, we're going to get colder temperatures. You may just need that little bit of help. And so just to clarify, when we're talking about utilities. What does that entail? The utility aspect pays for uh, electricity. So if you're on a city owned and you have water, garbage, or sewage, we'll only pay for the electrical portion and fees associated with it. If you own current and arrears, we'll pay past electrical and, and, and then any of the fees associated with it. We do, pay, we do buy propane. We can pay propane and natural gas. So any, any actually, you know, fuel source, we can. And so you were talking to me earlier a little bit about kind of streamlining this e outreach program with some QR codes to make things a little bit easier. Talk to me about that. What we're going to do, instead of just normal coming on TV and speaking about the program, we're going to try to put out a Q uh, QR code system to where we post those throughout the county. So that way you don't have to hunt a website down, look for a link. You'll just go up there with your, with your smartphone and look at it, and it'll pull it up, just like a lot of people do menus at restaurants. So we're going to try to make it to where everybody can get access to it. We'll have that code on, on our website. We'll have it on Facebook. We'll have it, uh, we're going to try to send it to all the utility companies. We're, we're, we're currently updating that information to make sure everything is good uh, so that when you do get it, it's not old data. And when we're talking about the application process, I know you said that in January it do, you do have to reapply. Every so January. people should apply now still for the end of the year, correct? Yeah. Uh, people have not applied yet this year. So if you've already applied, no need to reapply unless you have a, an extreme situation. And we might have crisis funds for it, but uh, every January we have to recertify income. So if you apply the 1st of December, you're going to have to reapply again in January. 
but we recommend you do that because it's a different set of funds and, and, and cycle. Uh, we also, with the stimulus package that are coming through, we have double the money. So we have additional funds that are coming in as well, and those funds cycle the same time as these, January through December. So there's plenty of money for, for everyone out there that in a bind or not in a bind, and we want to focus on priority households, which are elderly seniors, people with disabilities, uh, people with very young young children. So we want to focus on those and make sure those people understand the help's out there if you need it. And so for anyone watching this that still has questions, how can they get that information? The way you can apply on a, uh, you can go to Brad, uh, BB Cog's website and uh, there's a link for, for energy housing or housing and just click on it and follow through. Okay, perfect. Or give us a call. And anything else that you think people should know about the utility assistance program or just the application process in general? Just the application process. Uh, we'll get those QR codes out there and hopefully, you know, uh, visiting with y'all, people know where to look and how to look for it, and, and then we're ready to spend the money. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you. Now I'll have all of that information up on kbtx.com this afternoon. After the show, give me a little bit to kind of put together those links and the people you need to talk to and what you need to do, the application process and how everything works. All of that, I'll bundle it up, put it in a web article, put it on kbtx.com so it's easily accessible. All you'll have to do is click on the links and able to apply or get in contact with someone from the Council of Governments. All right, y'all, I hope that conversation was, was helpful to anyone in need of assistance paying their utilities. They have an influx of money right now at the Council of Governments because of the stimulus checks, because of the American Rescue Plan, all of this COVID-19 federal money being filtered through the Council of Governments, and all they want to do with it is help people in the community who need that assistance. So definitely check out the BVCOG website. It's literally just BVCOG. Dot org. Again, I'll have all of that information up on our website at kbtx.com later this afternoon. Let's take a quick break and regroup when we get back. We'll talk about some more national headlines before we get to, of course, our KBTX newscast at 12. Be right back. Former President Donald Trump is getting his day in court as he tries to block White House records from Capitol riot investigators. A federal judge has a hearing set for November 4th. The House Select Committee requested the documents and records in its investigation into Trump's role in the January 6th riot. 
However, Trump is claiming executive privilege to stop that from happening. Time is a key issue for Mr. Trump. He has until November 12th to get a court order to stop the National Archives from turning over the documents. And a one-time member of the Trump administration is expected to testify this week about the siege on the U.S. Capitol. Former Justice Department official Jeffrey Clark will comply with a subpoena from the January 6th committee. That hearing is scheduled for this Friday. More controversy surrounding Facebook. Now Facebook staff are being told to brace for more bad headlines in the coming days. More news based on the leaked documents are on the way. Now it comes as the documents from the Facebook whistleblower Francis Haugen recently revealed more about the company's role in the Capitol riots on January 6th. An internal analysis by Facebook found the company's policies did not slow down the quote, stop the steal and quote, Patriot Party movements, at least not until the insurrection began. Facebook has denied Haugen's conclusions. Execs say that she cherry-picked documents to present an unfair portrayal of the company. Let's talk more about that spending bill, shall we? Well, House Speaker Nancy Pelosi says Democrats are close to reaching an agreement on the framework for the Biden administration's so-called Build Back Better plan. The original $3.5 trillion bill is now down to $2 trillion in order to appease opposing Democrats. It is less than we had uh, was projected to begin with, but it's still bigger than anything we have ever done in, the, in, in terms of addressing the needs of America's working families. She says that she expects the deal to be done before the president heads to Europe later this week. Speaker Nancy Pelosi also says Congress has to pass the bipartisan infrastructure bill by Halloween, that's the Sunday, before an extension of the funding for surface transportation expires. Some Republicans agree repairing the nation's aging infrastructure is a must, but they're not sold on the White House plan to expand the social safety net. And as we've been hearing, a global traffic jam of ships carrying goods is affecting consumers and businesses across America. Companies are also finding it difficult to hire warehouse workers and truck drivers. Carter Evans shows how some businesses are being pushed to the brink. Instead of being $39.99 retail, now it's officially $54.99. Outdoor toy maker Ed O'Brien is raising prices on some of his most popular products. You don't think people will want to pay that for this? I do not think people will pay that. We will lose most of our sales on this item now due to the retail price. But he says he has no choice. Because of the port backlog, he's paying more for shipping than ever before. The cost for a container shipping out of China was $6,500 from China to Denver. How much is it now? It's uh, $30,000. How much have you lost this year? We have faced over $2 million of unexpected expenses. His company's now on track for a 40% decline in sales. Nationwide, suppliers can't get items to stores fast enough, in part because there's a shortage of warehouse workers and truck drivers with more than half a million job openings. Companies almost certainly won't be able to fill all the roles they hope to this holiday season. Andy Challenger with outplacement firm Challenger Gray and Christmas says companies are trying to entice workers. Amazon is offering signing bonuses up to $3,000 and starting wages up to $2,250 an hour. Walmart and Target are offering free college tuition. What it's mostly doing is hiring away workers from their competitors, and that's why we're seeing some of the highest quits rates that the country's ever recorded. For Ed O'Brien, there are even bigger concerns if things don't turn around. We've already had a round of layoffs, and I obviously would expect more the way that it's going. Carter Evans, CBS News, Denver, Colorado. Now, if you're someone who's thinking, well, you know, the shortages haven't affected me. Well, with the holidays just around the corner, this one might affect us all. According to experts, it might be a good idea for Texans to stock up on alcohol right now. That's because supply chain issues are impacting the supply of alcohol in the country. 
Now, many stores across the Lone Star State are limiting how many products customers can buy at one time. Experts say there's also a shortage of glass, which is making it difficult for local manufacturers to produce their brands. Now, I'm not encouraging the drinking of alcohol, but if you are 21 and older and you drink responsibly, safely, and you call an Uber or a Lyft when you're drinking instead of drinking and driving, you might want to stock up on some alcohol now for the holiday season because it looks like there is a shortage of alcohol in glass containers across the country and in Texas. Now, let's switch gears and talk a little bit more about what's happening with the White House and Afghanistan. Now, Afghan refugees could have new homes across the United States pretty soon. More than 55,000 Afghans have been living on military bases now for weeks, including one here in Texas. Now, the Biden administration is launching a program to let U.S. veterans with ties to their former allies bring them to their cities. Currently, a refugee agency must have a local office or a network of community groups that can act as a support system. The new initiative is meant to open more locations where refugees can go. In addition to veterans, the administration is working with nonprofits like Community Sponsorship Hub and even Airbnb to find new homes for the Afghan families. Former Delaware Governor Jack Markle is leading this effort. He says the goal is to provide a safe and dignified welcome to the allies who served by our side in Afghanistan. Now, on another note, the U.S. Border Patrol is reporting an unprecedented number of arrests made at the southern border. Last year, the agency says it made nearly 1.66 million arrests for unlawful crossings. That's the highest annual number on record. The previous record was back in 2000. The number of monthly border arrests began to rise during the Trump administration, then skyrocketed when President Biden took office. Now here's something that might sound familiar. I feel like I sound like a broken record talking about it, but I'm sure everyone does. The Supreme Court is letting that controversial Texas abortion ban remain in effect while those legal challenges to the law play out. The high court will hear oral arguments on the law a week from today. So that's next Monday, November 1st. The law is a direct challenge to Roe versus Wade, the landmark decision that legalized abortion nationwide. When they hear oral arguments, the justices will focus on the unusual construction of the Texas law. Now, here's what's different about it. Texas officials aren't allowed to enforce the law. Instead, it's private citizens from any state in the country that can bring a civil lawsuit against anyone who helps a pregnant person seeking an abortion. Now, again, those oral arguments are set to take place next Monday, November 1st. So I'm sure we'll hear more about the ban or going back into effect or the temporary ban of that ban. It's a lot of back and forth. We'll hear more about that next week. Now here's something that's taking our state by storm. Have you heard of Delta 8? Well, CBD stores, smoke shops, and convenience stores across Texas received a surprise from the state as, the, as Texas made Delta 8, which is a commonly sold hemp product, illegal. The Department of State Health Services updated the wording on its website indicating that its guidance for the Schedule 1 controlled substances had been changed to include Delta 8. Local Delta 8 retailers say the updated wording is not sufficient communication from the state to business owners being asked to make these changes. And because of that issue, News 3's Morgan Weaver is going to be working on a story today with our local smoke shops here in Bryan College Station, talking to them a little bit about this lack of communication between uh, the state and business owners after they made Delta 8 illegal, or at least still illegal. It's a lot of up in the air. Some of our police law enforcement agencies saying it's always been illegal. Others arguing the opposite. A lot of back and forth. We'll hear more later today from Morgan Weaver. All right, y'all, we've got just about five minutes left. So let's talk a little bit about a recap. Let's talk about what we've talked about so far today. Then we'll get into some more stuff after our newscast at 12 for that last 30 minutes or so 
of the day. Now let's talk first about COVID-19. Now I'm going to pull up our COVID-19 dashboard here in Brazos County to show you a little bit of good news, a little bit of hope as we go into a Halloween weekend and then into our holiday season here. Well, we're reporting 314 active cases today, just four new cases reported by the health district. Remember back on October 1st, that's when we hit our peak, that Delta variant hitting our community hard. We were nearing 3000 active cases that's reported in just one day. Well, now we're almost under 300 here. Hospitalizations, new cases and active cases have been on a steady decline. That downward trend continuing from October 1st when we hit our peak down to today on the 25th. We've seen declines in hospitalizations now that seeing that number that 4.11 percent that's the number of COVID-19 patients hospitalized in our hospitals right now in Brazos County. The health district also reporting zero new deaths today. So a little bit of good news there. But of course, we know that we're not out of the clear yet. Nine million eligible Texans still haven't gotten their first dose of the COVID-19 vaccine. Now we know that as we go into that holiday season, we're looking forward to seeing our loved ones after a year apart or more, maybe 18 months apart. But health experts around the world and local experts and doctors right here in Bryan and College Station encouraging us and urging us to get vaccinated before going on those holiday trips or gathering with loved ones. There are kids who are not eligible for the vaccine yet. We have older people or immunocompromised people, maybe who haven't gotten those booster shots yet. They're encouraging people who are not vaccinated to wear a mask or to just get vaccinated before making those trips or gathering with people for the holiday season. Now there's good news here. Pfizer is one step closer to getting that authorization for kids age five to 11 to be able to receive a little bit of a lower dose of the COVID-19 vaccine, but our kids could be vaccinated for the holidays. Now that decision goes from the FDA then to the CDC. If it receives approval for that emergency use authorization, then we could see that approval by next week. Then the rollout, of course, easily uh, produced. Now we know that the Biden administration has already en uh, entailed their plans to uh, administer the, co the COVID-19 vaccine to kids as soon as it's approved. So we don't have to worry about that. Now, if you're a Moderna person, Moderna is also working on a trial right now for kids age six to 11. So one year above, but they have not, they, so uh, they're showing good signs right now. Again, a little bit of a lower dosage than an adult got, but that information, that data has not been approved yet or peer reviewed. So that's still in the very preliminary stages. Pfizer is well on its way to be approved for kids five to 11. That decision could be made as soon as next week. The Moderna is working on a trial run right now with kids across the United States, seeing how they react to it. Then once that data is reviewed, they will submit emergency use authorization to the FDA. Once it's approved by the FDA, it goes to the CDC. Once it's approved by both, voila, we have a vaccine eligible to kids. Now, one more thing is that the Biden administration is ramping up its efforts for at home COVID testing. Now we know that with the colder weather, which we don't have today, but we will eventually, more people are getting sick. That's just how it works. People have allergies, people are cold, they catch colds, they catch the flu. But with the COVID-19 pandemic still ongoing, we wanna make sure that everyone in the community has access to testing and without having to go wait in line in their car for a drive-through walk up or pay for them. So they're trying to make at-home testing more available so that nationwide people can just go to the store, buy a couple of those, have those at home for the holiday season. So that's a little bit of good news there in the fight against the COVID-19 pandemic. Again, pull it up one more time here in Brazos County. Things are looking really a lot better for us. Of course, we're not out of the clear yet. Millions of Texans still eligible for the COVID-19 vaccine that have not gotten vaccinated yet, but things are looking better. We're still trending downward with our active cases and our hospitalizations. Now the hospitalizations, that's a big one. We saw a huge spike in hospitalizations and in deaths 
during that Delta variant surge here in Brazos County. But since October 1st, when we hit our peak of the pandemic, things have been looking a lot better, a lot brighter, which is great news as Halloween is this weekend and there are haunted houses. There's a bar crawl. There is, you know, trunk or treating, trick or treating. There's so much happening in our community this weekend that we want to be safe and healthy for. So good news there on the fight against the COVID-19 pandemic and good news that there's a ton of fun stuff happening and that it's not getting canceled this year. So really exciting stuff. We'll talk a little bit about that when we get back from the KBTX newscast at 12. But for now, I am going to leave you guys for about 30 minutes here. So pop on over to your TV, watch our newscast at 12. Come back with me at 1230. We have a lot of updates to get through. Lots of good stuff still in store for you for the last 30 minutes of our show, including we will take a look at Noodle and see if it's Bones or No Bones Day. All right, you're going to want to stick around. Come back with me at 12.30 so we can talk to Noodle and see if it's a Bones Day or a No Bones Day. I'll see you guys back here in 30 minutes.
Howdy everyone, welcome back to News 3. Now just about 12.30 here, so let's get on with the next 30 minutes of our newscast here. Now we're gonna start with this. Let's talk about the weather now. It's about 12.30. Haven't been outside in probably about five hours at this point, but when I woke up this morning, there was no sunshine. I walked outside and it was muggy, it was humid, it was kind of gross. Has the sun broken through yet? Do we see Mr. Sun? Is it warm outside? Someone let me know, but let's take a look at this. Now, right now, today, we are slated to reach a record high. It's expected to be the warmest October 25th in nearly 30 years. Now, from October 1st till today, we've already had six days over 90 degrees here in the Brazos Valley, and today could bring a seventh, which again, could be hot enough to be remembered for years to come. Now, our record high would beat 1992. It is supposed to be 92 degrees today, but if that cloud cover does end up staying, it's possible we don't reach that 92 degree weather. So let me know, if the clouds broke and the sun is shining through, is it 92 degrees outside yet? Maybe not yet, it's a little early, but we're gonna continue talking about the weather because how strange, California is actually experiencing some of its worst weather in years. Now, forecasters are calling it a bomb cyclone that's already blasted through the Pacific Northwest, killing two people. In Northern California, some streets are completely underwater or covered by mudslides in areas that were burned by the summer wildfires. Now, radar shows how much rain there is, and it's up to 10 inches falling in just the last 24 hours. We're going to get an update now from Carmichael, California, which is just east of Sacramento. It has been a monster storm, uprooting trees, flooding rivers in Northern California, and turning creeks into mud-filled rivers. In San Rafael, just north of San Francisco, there were more than 300 calls for help from fire or police. That's four times what it is normally. Across the region, officials say they may not know the full extent of the damage in those burn areas until later today. With the rains and winds coming through, it's kind of, it's, it's uh, anyone's guess on what's going to occur. Now look at this. That big truck was almost pushed over by strong winds on a bridge just north of San Francisco. And on the world famous Golden Gate Bridge, gale force winds actually caused vibrations that created this eerie whistle that you could apparently hear for miles. Listen. Farther inland, a substantial landslide shut down this major highway in the same area as this summer's massive Dixie fire that happened just north of Sacramento. Closer to Sacramento in the town of Carmichael, there were roads underwater as of late Sunday. More than five inches of rain fell in California's state capital, breaking the previous record that was set back in 1880. Meanwhile, up in Washington state, this road east of Seattle was closed after a tree fell and crushed a vehicle, killing two people. All I can think about right now are their families. It's something like so random, it's just awful. David Begno, CBS News. I mean, torrential downpours, flooding, mudslides over in the Pacific Northwest, here potentially the hottest October 25th on record. So what's going on? Let's talk for just a minute about climate change. Now, a new United Nations report says that greenhouse gases in the atmosphere have reached a record high. According to the World Meteorological Organization's annual greenhouse gas bulletin, the concentration of carbon dioxide was 149% higher in 2020 than before widespread industrialization. The last time CO2 levels were this high was three to five million years ago, when it was up to three Celsius degrees warmer and water levels were up to 20 meters higher. The current trend puts us on a road to far exceed the 1.5 to two degrees Celsius temperature increase limit that was set earlier by the Paris Agreement. The report found that while the COVID-19 pandemic resulted in a temporary decline in new emissions, it did not impact the amount of greenhouse gases that were already in the atmosphere. That number is going to continue to increase. 
All right, let's switch gears. Let's take a look at some of our local headlines now. This was news over the weekend. We should know something more today about the sudden closure of the Century Square parking garage over the weekend. Officials say the garage was closed Saturday night after a large crack was found in the concrete. Customers were told to move their vehicles out of the garage and now it's closed out of an abundance of caution. Well, until today when an inspection should be completed. Now, this same thing happened back in 2019. Back then, Century Square said a large crack was a cosmetic inconvenience, but wasn't a danger. Now, again, that investigation is happening this afternoon, so we should have some more information on what's happening, whether or not it's going to be safe to park there, whether there's going to be any construction on that parking garage. Yikes, what an inconvenience, and also could be in danger. So we'll have updates still to come in our later newscast. Let's talk about those Texas A&M Aggies. How well our football team sure has turned its season around, winning big at Kyle Field this Saturday night, 44 to 14 to stay undefeated against South Carolina. News 3 Sports Morgan Weaver breaks down another solid showing for the Maroon and White. Anaya Smith knew his team needed to get out to a fast start Saturday night against South Carolina, and he took it upon himself to make that happen. The Aggies forced a punt on South Carolina's first drive, and Smith took that punt 95 yards for the score. It was the longest punt return for a touchdown in FBS this season, and the jump start to AM's 44-14 domination over the Gamecocks. My whole message to the team was, you know, let's go ahead and start fast. Let's start fast, let's start strong, and go ahead and get an edge on them real quick. And it just so happened that my opportunity came, and I was like, shoot, I'm going to be that guy. Jalen Weidemeyer added two touchdown catches in Saturday's win and became Texas A&M's all-time tight end leader in receiving yards. But his favorite memory came before the game, when he was surprised by his brother Tyrese. I uh, was stationed in the Navy and uh, came down and surprised me before the game. My parents made sure not to tell me. I hate that, but uh, they, he, he surprised me during the spirit walk, and it was so great to see him. I was, that was the happiest I've ever been in a while. It was a third straight victory for Texas A&M, which knocked off top-ranked Alabama two weeks ago before beating Missouri last week. The winning streak comes after A&M dropped the previous two games. I mean, to lose two games like that, be 3-0 and then lose two games and, and come back against the stretch we had, I'm very proud of them. I'm happy for them. Now, we got to maintain and remember why we've had success and continue. we got we got a heck of a grind left, but there's hey, there's a lot of football left to be played. The Aggies will now take a well-deserved bye week before taking on Auburn November 6th. News 3 Sports, Morgan Weaver. Now, when we take a look at AP's top 25 poll, Georgia remains at number one. Alabama leaps Oklahoma up to number three. Ole Miss cracks the top 10, and Kentucky moves up to 12. Texas A&M has also moved up three spots now at number 14. Auburn is ranked 18th. All six ranked SEC teams on the rise this week. Now a little bit more on the Aggie football. Now the Aggie football season is shaping up to be one to remember, and that could pay off in many different ways for the players. Now remember back in July when the NCAA cleared the way for college athletes to benefit financially from their name, from their image and likeness. Now sometimes getting those benefits is easier said than done, but a group of Aggies has formed the A&P agency to represent athletes and help close those kinds of deals and connect the best college athletes to big brands. I own the Aggie for five years in the College Station market, so I mean I've had experience with talking to brands and selling, uh, I guess, advertising. And uh, now that we have a chance to do with athletes and give back to the community and helping them get a little stress off, you know, their daily life, they have to worry about school, the sport, and now that and now they have to worry about, you know, business. Former Texas A&M University Board of Regents member Tony Busby oversees the legal team of the A&P agency. Now, in other sports news, Tom Brady is now the first player ever in NFL history to pass for 600 touchdowns. 
and it didn't take him long either yesterday. Now, he threw a nine-yard pass to Aggie Mike Evans in the first quarter against the Bears. Laura Podesta has that story from New York. Tom Brady set yet another NFL record Sunday, his 600th career touchdown pass to Mike Evans. But Brady has it with a strike. But this milestone comes with a twist. Evans gave the instantly very valuable ball to a fan in the stands. Check out the wide receiver's reaction when he was told Brady had just set a record. The fan was a real sport about it. After a brief negotiation, he gave the football back in return for a bunch of Brady swag. That's a bad deal. It is. That is a terrible deal. Brady was thankful. I don't actually keep two things, so um, in that circumstance, I just yeah, I felt like that might be a good one. He, he's going to get something nice in return, so we'll get him a helmet or a couple jerseys or some other stuff. Brady, who's considered by many to be the greatest quarterback in NFL history, ended his day with another memorable moment. He gave a hat to a grateful young fan who has battled brain cancer. Brady said moments like that put a lot in perspective. Laura Podesta, CBS News. Well, as far as that ball goes, one sports memorabilia, more memorabilia expert. I didn't even know that existed. A sports memorabilia expert, okay? Well, they say that it could be worth up to half million dollars, $500,000 for that touchdown throw, Tom Brady's 600th touchdown. Speaking of crazy amounts of money, take a look at this. This pair of Michael Jordan sneakers broke a record at an auction over the weekend. The Nike Airships, that's what they're called. These sneakers were auctioned off yesterday by Sotheby's. They say cards collector Nick Fiorella paid $1.47 million for them. The price tag set a new world record for the most money ever paid at an auction for a pair of sneakers. Jordan wore these red and white pair of sneakers in 1984 during the fifth game of his rookie season with the Chicago Bulls. What's something that you would pay $1.47 million for? Is there any sort of inanimate or, uh, you know, any sort of object or thing that you think, yes, this material item, I will pay $1.47 million to be able to stare at this item, to play with this, to touch this. Whatever you do with a material item like a pair of Jordan sneakers, I doubt he's going to wear that $1.5 million pair, right? I think so. I don't know. I don't own any $1.5 million sneakers of my own. These cost about 30 bucks at TJ Maxx, but uh, I wear them. I don't know. I don't know. What would you pay $1.47 million for? That's a little crazy. All right. Well, let's check in with noodles today. Now, let's check in and talk about if it's boned or no bones day. So I do have an update for you here. Noodle's dad, Jonathan, is traveling right now with Noodle. He didn't have time, he said, to post today. So yesterday he said that we have entered a bones day era. So we have been ordered to treat the next few days as a bones day until Noodle gives further guidance. So you heard Noodle Today is a bones day, which means you go after your aspirations. If you've been putting things off, you need to check things off of your to-do list. What a better, what better day to do that than a Monday? It's a good day for a bones day. So you heard it here. The next couple days are gonna be bones days according to Noodles. So if you've got stuff that you've been procrastinating on, now is the time to do it. And it's not just things you've been procrastinating on that you don't wanna do. It's things that maybe are a little out of your comfort zone or you know things that you've been a little nervous to do. Today, the next couple days, it's a bones day. Noodles said it's time to gear up, be brave, be courageous, and go after your ambitions. It is a bones day. All right, y'all, really quickly, if you're watching News 3 now, right now, I just want to talk about social media. Now, um, we have switched. We were on Facebook a couple of weeks ago, and a lot of you were tuning in. Since we switched to YouTube, we've lost 
quite a few followers and I just feel like maybe it's because YouTube is a little more difficult to navigate to, right? If it's on Facebook, it kind of just pops up. A lot of people just scrolling through Facebook in the morning. YouTube, not so much. So if you give me a follow or a like, this is my Facebook page. You can find me at, at Abigail Metch KBTX. That's at Abigail Metch KBTX. If you give me a like or follow, I will be sure to post links and updates of all things News 3 Now right here on my Facebook page. If you are a Twitter user, let me pull up my Twitter for you as well. Give me a follow here at, at Abigail Metch TV. You will get the updates on when we're going live and who we're going to be talking to that day on News 3 Now. If you're interested in any of the topics, the headlines, the people we're going to be interviewing, you'll get that information on one of my two social media pages. So that Facebook page at Abigail Metch KBTX. Give me a like or a follow for all things News 3 Now. Same with that Twitter page at, at Abigail Metch TV. And hey, if you're someone that likes tuning into News 3 now, tell your friends and family members how they can watch. You can like, you can subscribe, whatever other wacky things YouTubers tell you to do at the beginning and end of all of their videos. Do that. I'm not a YouTuber, but, you know, I am now. I'm coming into my own as a YouTube star here on News 3 now as we are on YouTube live now. So with that, I am going to be concluding our show for the day. I'm going to wrap up here a little bit early because it's a Monday. Not only is it a Monday, but it is a Bones Day, which means that it's time for us to get things done and check things off of our to-do list. That includes me. So we're going to wrap up our show with this. It's Monday. It's a little muggy outside. It's hot. It's humid. It's October. This month flew by. At this time next week, we'll be saying happy first day of November to you all. So with this, I urge you, I encourage you to do a mental health check-in. We usually do those on Fridays, but I want everyone to be safe, to be healthy, and to know that you are loved and I'm happy that you're here. Reach out, get the help that you need. There's nothing more important than your mental health. You are brave, and if you're struggling right now, we love you, and we hope that you feel better soon. You're loved, and I'm happy that you're here. You're loved, and I'm happy that you're here. You are loved, and I'm happy that you're here. Happy Monday, October 25th, y'all. I'll see you back here on KBTX YouTube Live tomorrow at 11 o'clock in the morning with some more great stories. See you tomorrow.